<laughs> I cannot even untie that man's shoelaces. Don't put me in the same level with him. Wow. God is good? And all the time, God is good. Do I have some prayer warriors in the house? Amen. Amen. Revival begins with prayer. It begins with prayer. That's, that's, that's it. Prayer is the work. Prayer is the work. It's the thing that ushers, in, ushers us into where God wants us to be. I've always desired to be part of a revival in my generation. I've always desired to be part of something God is doing. And so I'm, I'm so excited to be here right now where God is working. Um, we, we are, we are, today we're really talking basics. And we're going through some of the, the core um, just the things we've been learning, the practices we've been learning that are helping us become prepared for what God is doing. And then uh, we're going to get into a bit more, uh, some of the technical stuff tomorrow. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about the practices and start, some of the things we've been talking about are going to just become so clear. And some of them will become so easy uh, tomorrow. So, but today is more of just some of the theory, some of the practice. So uh, let me have my, I think I forgot to bring my laptop, it's in my bag. Um, my, my bag, not, not my wife's bag. My, <laughs> Pastor James, seriously, you, you can't tell the difference. <laughs> We've known each other for so long. <laughs> huh? I carry a man bag. Oh, you're just making fun of me. <laughs> wow. He's saying something about me. So I want to talk about evangelism and visitation. Evangelism and visitation. And uh, really, I'm just, this is, again, you know these practices. And some of the stuff, I'm giving it to you because you will be teaching others. You'll be responsible to teach others. So even as you're taking notes, take them with the sense that this is entrusted to you so you can teach others. Um, and when you have your disciples, they'll want, they'll want to know, why do we pray? And so you'll be telling them, this is why we pray. When they ask you the questions, why am I praying? And God already knows. And you'll be knowing this is, so it's not just for you, it's to pass on. So even as we speak about evangelism and visitation, it's important for you to understand it's not just a practice you do because Pastor M said you do it, but this is, this is why it's essential for us in this season and why God's desire uh, is for us to be in this way. So evangelism, uh, what's evangelism? Introducing people to Jesus. It's basically introducing people to Jesus with the intention of helping them become followers or disciples. That's the whole idea of evangelism. It's like I want you to meet the person I'm following. And I want you to become a follower of that person. That's, that's what evangelism is. It's sharing the good news that I've already received. Somebody once said to me, evangelism is like, uh, one, it's, it's not because I'm superior to you that I share it. It's not because my life is better to you than, than you that I share it. He said it's like one patient uh, taking someone, a new patient in the hospital, but I'm taking you to the doctor. I'm not the doctor. But because I've been around the hospital for a bit longer than you, I can take you to where the doctor is. So in evangelism, I don't draw people to myself. I draw them to the doctor, the real doctor, who's able to heal them. Uh, what's visitation? Visitation is intentionally going to someone uh, at their home or in their workplace, uh, engaging in their space before you invite them into your space. And the re there's a reason we do that. One, it dignifies the relationship. And it makes them feel comfortable to accept your hospitality. So when you, when you visit uh, somebody, it, it has a power. And I think we haven't yet unlocked the power of visitation uh, when we enter into people's spaces. I've been challenging our pastors. When you have guests come on Sunday, uh, don't just take them and then send them an email, a, a blank email, the email that we call it the cockroach letter, the one that just, uh, dear, you just fill in the name, and everything else was, was written five years ago. Don't send them that cockroach letter. Go and visit them. And have a team in your church that actually visits people. Can we, I want to come and see your work. I want to come and see your house. Uh, there's some power that is released when you do that, that even I'm still grappling with. I've been doing it uh, since we landed in June last year, and it's just blowing my mind, the understanding the power of visitation. Um, Bishop Doug has written a, a book. And that guy is a bit insane. Uh, he's just crazy. Uh, and I really honor that man of God because... Um, I think if not for the things he was doing and writing, uh, I wouldn't have the clarity I have right now. Um, there's a lot of movements, and I, I shared this in the first gathering. Why did I lean so much into this shift the way I am right now? It's because the mentors, the people that I was following, I followed a lot of great men of God, and I didn't even know I was following, but I was following them. And many times people asked, why is Mavuno this way? Or why is Mavuno accelerated this way? Uh, whenever you want to see fire, you stand on the shoulders of giants. 
And so I've been standing on the shoulders of giants all this time. I stood on Pastor Oscar's shoulders. Uh, there are other people that I stood on their shoulders just by reading their stuff. I'd never met them. Uh, people like uh, Bill Hybels, Rick Warren, Andy Stanley, uh, other people. Uh, just the different leaders who lead mega churches. And you become who you follow. So because I was following these men, I was leading a, a big mega church. Then God had put in our hearts that we were... <laughs> God's vision, yes, the mega church is a part of it. But it was to be a movement, a gospel movement of churches across the world. And one day it dawned on me, none of these men is leading a gospel movement of churches across the world. You become who you follow. So I had to start looking, God, who are the people doing it? And I want to learn from them. I want to see men that you've anointed and women and that are doing these great things. And I began to realize that the great movements of the Holy Spirit across the world are not happening in the U.S., uh, which is where I got my education from. Uh, they're not happening there. They're not happening in Europe. They're happening in very interesting places. They're happening in Nigeria. They're happening in Ghana. They hap so West Africa. They're happening in Korea, so parts of Asia. They're happening in uh, parts of Latin America. Uh, Pastors is like, they're happening in Uganda. They're starting to happen in Uganda. But, but, but they've not been there. I mean, we're talking about which churches do you know in Uganda that have 40,000 churches across the world? I mean, that's what I'm talking about. And we don't see them in, in our part of the world. And in the States, I, I, you don't see them. I remember talking to an expert in church planting. He told me he only knows of two, um, two gospel movements, global movements in the U.S., uh, the whole country. And so it's, it's just, that's not the place it's happening. In Europe, I think I know two as well. But you go into Nigeria and <laughs> between Minas Chapel and RCCG, I, those are the only ones I knew when I went. Let me tell you, on the way between the two, it's like, oh, that is... Mountain of Fire Chapel Ministries. They're in every country in the world. They're dead. It's like it's happening. But here's a difference. None of them write about it. They're, they're so in the middle of it. They're so caught up with what God is doing. They don't have time to write. And so you look for the literature and you just can't find it. But the one good thing about Bishop Doug is he writes. And so even if it's hard to understand sometimes, at least he writes it. And so I'm so, so grateful to that man of God because I think he's given a roadmap of this is how a gospel movement operates. So I'm, I'm not ashamed to say I follow him. Uh, I follow his reading. I read a lot of his books. I follow Apostle Moses Mukisa because he's also uh, in the middle. He did something very powerful. He took Bishop Doug's writings and he combined them with what Michael Breen, um, who is, he, he wrote Building a Discipleship Culture, which we've studied here at Mavuno as well and sought to practice. But he had the wisdom to put those two things together. And something exploded when he did that. So he's even doing things that Bishop Doug is not doing as well. And so I honor him as well uh, because of the things I'm learning. And I'm that guy. By the way, in my life, I've always known the truth that originality is overrated. Uh, I've never tried to be original in my life. In fact, part of it was because I'm not a very original person. <laughs> when you're not something, you don't try to be it. I'm not that guy, but I'm really good at listening to good ideas and implementing them. In fact, many times I listen to people's good ideas and I implement them better than they've implemented them. That's always been a thing that I've... I become better than the original. I copy it better than the original. And so this is something that I have to say, that there's nothing... I don't teach original stuff. I teach stuff. I'm following others, a great cloud of witnesses that have gone before me. And if the Lord could just bless us in a little bit in the way that he's blessed some of those church movements, my God, I would be so excited. Uh, because these are people who've been in the presence of God and they've experienced uh, revival in powerful ways. So Bishop Doug has a book called 120 Reasons Why You Must Be a Soul Winner. So, but I'm not going to give you 120 reasons. I'm, I'm going I'm to give you just, let me see if I can get to 12. Let me see if I can get to 12 reasons. Why evangelism is so powerful. Why it's so important for you. Why it's not an option. Just like prayer. These are things that are, it's like how you breathe. It's who you are. It's part of your DNA. Number one, evangelism is sharing Jesus' heart. Jesus' heart. Luke 19.10, the most powerful, concise mission statement of Jesus' uh, reason for being on earth. He says, the Son of God, Luke 19.10, sometime today. Okay. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's, I mean, that's why I'm here on earth. <laughs> There are many other reasons. You could give me many, but the son of man, he just breaks it down. I'm not here to be with religious people and hang out and do conferences. I'm here to seek and save the lost. And if you want to be like Jesus, if you claim that you're a follower of Jesus, 
If you say that he's your master and he saved you and you're, you're his, that's your job description. The reason God put you on earth, to seek and save the lost. And that's why God gave you that business. <laughs> that's why God put you in that office. Have you ever thought about it? That's the reason for your existence, to seek and save the lost. You could have gotten saved like boom and gone to heaven. Jesus, I accept you. And guys just see smoke. And the next thing you're in the master's house. By the way, there's nothing you'll do on earth that will make you more loved by God. You can't earn his love. His love was perfect for you at Calvary. There's no more love that he can give you because you prove it. There's, no, there's nothing you can prove or do that can make God love you more. So you're not on earth to earn God's love. You're on earth because God wants people saved. And so that's, that's, why, that's why he's put you there. So to be like him, to share his heart, this is what we must be. We must be people who bring people to him. Uh, Matthew, chapter, Matthew chapter 9 talks about Jesus seeing crowds. And Matthew chapter 9, um, who's at the back? Elaine. I need you to be faster than me. All right, there you go. Matthew 9, 36 to 38. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Uh, and then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And then verse 38, pray, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So it's like Jesus sees crowds. Many times people see crowds and they'll be like, man, I'm a rock star. <laughs> it's like they're all here to listen to me. My gosh, it's working. That's not Jesus' response. He sees all these crowds clamoring for him and his heart is broken. And the Bible said he has compassion on them because he can see how helpless they are. He can see how they're even coming to him for the wrong reasons. He can see how broken they are. The Bible says he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. But what does he do? Out of his compassion, he says, let me tell you what the problem is. There's too much harvest and there are no laborers. So start to pray that God would send out laborers into this harvest. Jesus says the, 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 the answer to the brokenness of his heart is laborers is people who will go out and make disciples. And I believe that Jesus today, is still, he still sees the crowds. He still sees those people who are looking rich and yet are lost, running after things. And unlike many of us who are impressed by them, his heart is broken. He can see that they are broken, they are, they are lost. Sheep without shepherd, without shepherd. And he's still saying, come on, ask the Lord to send out laborers. Ask the Lord to send out laborers. Ask him to send you. Because <laughs> the Lord needs laborers to bring in the harvest. There's the one thing God will never do. He'll never save somebody. He sends you to do the work. This is what he does. And the other thing is, there's no evangelism in heaven. Think about that. It's only here while we're here on earth. Number two, evangelism brings joy to the Father's heart. So one is sharing Jesus' heart, but number two, it's bringing joy. <laughs> if you ever wanted to make God happy, has any of you ever want to see a smile on your father's when you're a kid? It's like, I want daddy to be happy. I want to do something that just makes him say, oh, this is so awesome. Evangelism brings joy to the Father's heart. Uh, Luke, chapter, Luke chapter 15, verse 7. Luke 15, 7. If you can put that up. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who don't need to repent. It's like every time one person gives their life to Jesus, there's rejoicing in heaven. There's a party in heaven. Like angels, because heaven doesn't mean God. <laughs> heaven is, you, you get the picture, there's a plurality of people who are happy. Like, there's, like I think that like things stop. The big billboard goes, not another one, a name. Because I don't believe any of us is just a number in heaven. There's a name. And it's like, oh my goodness, he finally came to Jesus with this one. Oh my goodness, and there's a party. And at, maybe in church we're just like, oh. <laughs> Because we don't get it. This is why Jesus came. This is why he died. So the Father is rejoicing. There's rejoicing in heaven. God actually stops the meeting and says, Guys, pause. Let's just have a celebration. The lost son is back home. Uh, this is Luke chapter 15. It talks about that because it talks about the lost son. But before that, it talks about the lost sheep. Uh, and then it talks about the lost coin. And in Luke fifteen ten, it says, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Like one. It doesn't take like 50. Like you, guys, you just lead one person to Jesus. You've caused heaven to stop. That's so incredible, isn't it? 
like you just lead one person to Christ, your child, even your child, let them confess that Jesus is Lord and there's rejoicing in heaven on your account. Oh my goodness, when was the last time you brought rejoicing to heaven? Yeah, when was the last time heaven stopped because of you and there was a party because you brought someone to Jesus? This is what the Bible is telling us. Luke chapter 15 verse 20. Now that's the one that I really find interesting because it says, so he got up. Now you know the parable of the lost son is representing God's heart. The father represents God. And he says, so he got up, went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Who does that? Like this guy, he snubbed you. He said, you better die. Give me my inheritance. He insulted you. He took everything. He's like, he's rubbished your name. He's made you the shame of the village. But when he comes back, he's already planned how he's coming back. He's managing impressions. He's like, I'm going to tell my father. I, don't even, I can't even qualify. The Bible tells us when the father saw him, he lost dignity. He just ran towards him and hugged him. And you know the rest of the story. And Jesus is saying, you guys, you don't even understand my father. I think this is why the disciples say, teach us how to pray. Because like that guy you're talking about doesn't sound like the God we know. Like, like who does that? And guys, this is who Jesus is. Like that alcoholic brother of yours, my goodness, the day he gets saved, the father will leave his robes. He'll leave that meeting with the principalities and the angels. and the, You know how God's angels are so powerful? He leaves them and he runs to hug and to say, yes, my lost son is home. Like, guys, this is so powerful to understand that this is the thing you do to God's heart when you bring someone to Him. Like, God rejoices because of you. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that crazy? It's like, uh, one day I might get to heaven, I'm like, I missed so many opportunities to make my father happy. Like, wow, I had them they were all around me. God rejoices. We bring joy to our father's heart. Number three, evangelism is my job description. It's my JD. That's why I'm here on earth. You all know Matthew 28. Verse 18 to 20, it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, verse 20, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Oh, it's, you don't have it up there. And I'm with you. Behold, I'm with you. I'm with you. That's his promise. He's like, guys, you want to be guaranteed of God's presence? Share the gospel. Behold, I'm with you. It's like, he's like, like, like make, you're making this, I'm with you. <laughs> you don't have to pray for my presence, I'm there. Yes. The Father's presence is with you. Who wants the Father's presence in his life? Yeah, that's me. I want that assurance. And you don't have to pray for it. He says, go and make disciples, I'm with you. That's it. My goodness. Like, guys, the scripture is real, huh? Yep. It's true. These are not things that Jesus just said to make us happy. It's real. There's, there's a great quote. I don't know if you guys wrote it by William Booth. Did you, did you get that quote, William Booth? Um, yeah. So, so this is something he wrote. This, William Booth was a founder of the Salvation Army. And this is what he wrote. I thought this was very powerful. He said, not called, did you say? Not had the call, I think you should say. Is there anybody here who has ever said, me, I'm not called? Maybe it's those guys who are called, but me, I don't think I'm called. I haven't had the call. He says, not called, do you say? Not had the call, I think you should say. Put your ear down to the Bible and hear him bid you to go and pull sinners out of the fire of sin. Just listen to the Bible. You'll understand that you're called. Put your ear down to the burdened, agonized heart of humanity and listen to its pitiful wail for help. He's saying it's the reason you're feeling you're not called is because you're not listening to the cries around you. Go stand by the gate of hell and hear the damned and treat you to go to their father's house and beat their brothers and sisters and servants and masters not to come there. Remember Lazarus and the rich man? It's like that if you just went and put your ear on hell, you'd hear people telling you, why are you missing your opportunity? My relatives are dying like me and you're not doing anything about it. Go, then look at Christ in the face, whose mercy you've professed to obey, and tell him whether you will join heart and soul and body and circumstances in the march to publish his mercy to the world. Like, man, listen to the world. Listen to the lost. Open your heart to what God is saying. And then tell me whether you're called or not. Like all of us are called, guys. Tell your neighbor, he's talking about you. <laughs> yeah. There's nobody in this house who will say, oh, this is a word for pastors. You are a pastor in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, we're all called. We're all called, every one of us. This is our calling that we follow. So, so uh, an ambassador, you exist to represent heaven's agenda. We talked about that when we talked about prayer. 
That's, that's what you are. You're here as God's ambassador. We read the verses. And everything you do as a Christian should support heaven's agenda. Everything you're about should actually be supporting your primary mission, making disciples. And making disciples brings, begins by baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. How will they be baptized if they've not had? Yeah, they need to hear the gospel from somebody and you're it. We're God's plan A. I mean, it's very interesting because your career is a tool to help you do God's work. I really need to get that into our heads, guys. You don't, have a, like you don't need a career where you're going. In heaven, there are no engineers. It's already been built. Yeah. This engineering is not to help you. To, it's, like, it's just to give you opportunity to do God's will. That's what you're here for. The money you're making, it's just for you because God knows you need the money here to make disciples. To do the master's will, to multiply, to be fruitful. That's why he's giving you the money. It's so twisted when the money that is a tool becomes the obsession and the following of Christians. That your job makes you too busy to serve God. Oh my God, how? How do you worship the giver, uh, the gift instead of the giver? That's getting it twisted. Acts chapter 1 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That's what the Bible says. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. He's saying you want power. See, who doesn't want power? See, we want power. Yes. Here is why I will give you power. <laughs> Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me power. Power is not for you to become rich. Power is for you to become his witness. That's your job description. So he says, go and wait. Go and wait for the Holy Spirit. Guys, the Holy Spirit is coming. We are in the place where the Holy Spirit is going to break down. We are all waiting for that Holy Spirit to come. Guys, the Holy Spirit comes into your life to empower you to be witnesses. Yeah. That's the reason he comes. Yeah, he, he doesn't come to give you a nice religious experience goosebumps. or goosebumps. <laughs> he comes to help you become a witness. That's what he wants from us. And that's what we, we should desire. Mark chapter 16, he talks about going into all the world. That's his commission. I love how Mark says it. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That's Jesus' last command. Let's go and preach. Go make disciples. So, so by all accounts, his last command to us has to do with preaching the gospel. It's your job description. Number four, evangelism is taking my responsibility seriously. It's taking my responsibility seriously. It's interesting, Ezekiel chapter three, God speaks to Ezekiel and he uses a title <laughs> that Jesus uses on himself. So in a sense, Ezekiel is a type for Christ. But he says to Ezekiel, son of man, which means human being, basically. Uh, son of man, I've made you a watchman to the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. Verse 18. When I say to a wicked person, you will surely die. And you don't warn them or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life. That wicked person will die for their sin and I will hold you accountable for their blood. Hmm. By the, I don't know if anyone is scared by that word. That's a really scary word. It's like they're going to die. <laughs> they will die. Because you know, it's almost like, it, it almost sounds unfair. Why are they dying? I'm, so, I'm not was meant to tell them I didn't tell them. But they will die because the laws of God are immutable. You do not have Jesus in your life, you will die. Jesus says, I'm the only way. So if they don't have the way, they will die. But he says, they will die, but I'll hold you accountable. So what is being held accountable? It's basically you're on trial for murder. They died because you wouldn't do your work. You killed them. By the way, guys, some of the st stuff you read in Scripture and you're like, my goodness, we, we are asleep as a church. We don't understand this. That people are dying all around us because of us. Not taking our responsibility seriously. Um, and, and you know, it's interesting because I know it sounds harsh, but we are assigning people to hell every day around us as a church. So how do we begin to take our responsibility seriously? And then how, how do we understand that, they, we are God's, that God will not send angels? Remember, remember how, how, how even the rich man tells Lazarus, tell, 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 let Lazarus go back. Like I know I can't leave hell, but let Lazarus who is in heaven, send him back to warn my brothers and sisters. God doesn't send angels to come and tell our people around us about him. We are it. If you're in a family where people don't know Jesus, you're plan A. If you're in an office where people don't know Jesus, you're plan A. If you own a business where your employees don't know Jesus, you're plan A. 
And when they die, you are responsible. It's that crazy. It's what? You're muted. <laughs> I need to increase volume. He says, you're not hearing. Okay. Maybe I need, maybe I need them to increase the volume out there. So, so, so Romans chapter 10, verse 14. Romans 10, 14. It says something interesting. It says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Yeah, guys, how are they supposed to go to heaven? And your, your mouth is closed. You're the channel. You're the road. You're the way that they will go to heaven with. So people will die unless we open our mouths. We must understand that the whole salvation of the whole world depends on us. That's God's plan. He's given us an incredible responsibility. He could have sent angels to do it, but he actually picked us. And it's actually not a bad thing. It's not too much pressure. It's actually a dignifying thing. It's a powerful thing. It means that God has entrusted us with the most important mission of all. It's like we as humans. That's why David says, consider the heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place. What is man that you're mindful of him? Like, like what, why would you care for humans so much you can give them your mission? The thing that you, you most care about, you've made us responsible. This is it. So, so don't get too busy to do God's work. Mark, Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. Just put that up. It says, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things came, come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. And this describes many of us. That the worries of this world, too much pressure of things I'm worrying about. The deceitfulness of wealth. Money comes and deceives us, and we feel comfortable. The desires for other things. And those things just choke God's word, choke God's commission, and silence it from our lives. Don't allow that to happen. Number five. Evangelism is the way to fruitfulness. In fact, it is fruitfulness. That's a crazy thing. Uh, Proverbs 11.30. I've been reading the Proverbs for the last two years, by the way. And I, I, I told you guys I'd read them for two years. So we just finished uh, in January. And I'm so excited. It's been such a great journey. Uh, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And the one who is wise saves life. <laughs> Wisdom is defined by being a lifesaver. And if you're righteous, then your tree and your fruit is lies. Can you see that passage? Your f the fruit is life. Like where I go, there is life. Because I'm saving lives. The whole book of wisdom is about, I mean, the, of Proverbs is about wisdom. And this is one of those definitions of wisdom that is very interesting. It's like a wise person saves lives. Why? Because they understand the times, isn't it? So they're like, I'm here for a purpose. I'm looking at the people around me. I'm just the office secretary. I'm the administrator. But I'm like, I'm here as a wise person. You guys have no idea. I'm here to uproot, to pull out the captives from the gates of hell. I'm here to take prisoners and bring them back to where they belong. I'm here to restore people to their father. I'm here. Yes, I'm taking orders. I'm writing notes. But you guys have no idea. I'm sleeper cell. I'm, as, I'm worse than Al-Shabaab in this office. Because when that bomb of the Holy Spirit goes off, all of you will be slain by the Spirit, you'll be serving God, you have no clue. That's why they put me here. Oh my gosh, when I understand that, I'm not here to do politics. I'm not here to impress people and try and look good. I have a master who I'm representing. Oof, man, that's understanding who you are, isn't it? Yeah, Philippians chapter 4 verse 1. It says something interesting as well. It says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. And he says, I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. Oh my goodness. Anybody I brought to Christ is my crown. You know what? It doesn't matter who preaches. Like, when I bring you to Christ, you are my crown. When I go to heaven, my crown will shine a bit brighter. <laughs> it's my fruitfulness. It's my reward. And that's the greatest reward you can ever have, bringing people to Christ. But let me tell you something, there's nothing more, it's just exciting when you bring people to Christ. But it says it's not just a physical, there's, a, there's actually a spiritual something happening when I bring people to Christ. Uh, Daniel chapter 12 verse 3 affirms that. Daniel 12 3, it says, Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Are you seeing that definition of wisdom again? Those who are wise, <laughs> connects it with righteousness again. And it says, you shine like the stars forever and ever. How many of you know the names of the four beetles? Let me just see. Show of hands. Okay, one, two, 
Even the musicians in the room don't know them. You guys, how do you not know the names of the four Beatles? You guys are like, what Beatles? Are they the ones that crawl? Which color are they? <laughs> guys, the Beatles was like the most popular band that ever existed. Those guys were like mobbed. They were known across the whole world. Like people were crazy. Girls would just faint when they walk into the room. They were so amazingly popular and huge. Okay, just put that verse up again. <laughs> Daniel chapter 12, put it back up again. Uh, boys to, you know boys to men. <laughs> How many of you know the names of all the boys to men? One, two, three, four. Are you seeing my point? The stars forever and ever. Let me tell you something. If you are one of those who are wise and bring people to Christ, you will be a star forever and ever. Forget these little rock stars. Beyonce, she's so big today. But I tell you, in our children's generation, she'll be like the Beatles. Nobody will know her. Nobody. Nobody will know her. I mean, right now, there are people who, if they were alive and they knew that in such a short time, nobody would know the names of the Beatles, they would have been shocked. Because they defined reality. But they were just stars for one generation. Maybe two at the most. You will be a star forever and ever. Don't miss your opportunity. Don't live through life just to make it to heaven smelling of smoke. Because the Bible says some of us, that's what will happen. With nothing, there's no stars. There's nothing you've brought in. You have no captives. There's nobody you've brought in with you. And they're asking, who's behind you? Oh, you're alone, eh? <laughs> okay, enter that section there. There's a line for you. It's like, next? <laughs> like, seriously? That's all you came with? All the money that I gave you? All the things I entrusted to you? And you came with yourself? The Bible calls that entering smelling of smoke. That's exactly it. But the Bible says we will be stars forever and ever. I know that's not the portion of anybody in this room to smell of smoke in heaven. We will be stars, God's people, forever. Because this is what God is calling us to be. Number six, evangelism will bring great joy and energize your faith. Oh, my goodness. It will bring great joy and energize your faith. There is nothing more joyous than bringing people to Christ. Pastor Jemo, is that true? Yep. Pastor Jemo is an evangelist. Every week he goes out and just shares the, the gospel here at Great Wall. The, let me just tell you, you just feel so happy. Yep. It's such a good thing. Luke chapter 10, verse 1 and verse 17. Uh, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And then go back, go, go to the end of the story, verse, seven, verse 17. Uh, so just, yeah, verse 17. And it says, The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submitted to us in your name. <laughs> like, my goodness, these guys are sent out, but when they come back, they come back how? Joy. They came back with joy. They saw things they never thought they would see. Before that, they, had, they knew Jesus chased demons. They didn't understand that they have the power to do the same thing. This is when revelation came upon them. When they brought people to Christ, they realized, oh my goodness, I have the power. Even me, I can chase demons. Let me tell you, chasing a demon is the most exciting thing in life. <laughs> oh my gosh, there's nothing more amazing. Just understanding, I, I got the power. You know, it's like, I have power. I actually do. Like, let me tell you, when I, that was the most crazy experience in my life. When I first chased out a demon, I was like, that thing that was making so much noise, I have power over it. Joy! Like, my goodness, this is who I am. It's such a joyous thing. Jesus told them, yes, I know that's a lot of joy, but at least rejoice fast that your name is in the book of life. <laughs> There's even more reason for joy here. Don't get it twisted. But there is joy. There's a lot of joy. Right now, I have people who I know who are just amazing people in this city. I mean, when I was talking, yesterday we were talking with, um, with some of the, the campus pastors and some of them were stuck in certain situations and I sent people to help them and they're like, how do you know this person? I'm like, I brought them to Christ years ago. Now they are significant. They are a huge person. I brought them to Christ. I discipled them. It's joy. It's joy. Sumit, I discipled you. Yeah, you're my, you're my crown. Yeah, he was in my first Mizizi class, by the way. Yeah, I love this guy. He was. Let me, tell you, let me tell you guys, even when I'm most depressed, even when I feel like when the devil tries to oppress me, I look around, I see Sumit, I see Phyllis, I see people like that. And I'm like, my goodness, I have a crown. 
Yeah. I have joy. Yeah. Because these are the things that nothing will ever take away from me. Oh, you can take my house, you can take my car, you can take even my, my life. But you can't take away from me the people are brought to Christ. Oh. Hey guys, store your treasures in heaven. Moth and rust cannot destroy the things that are given to you in this place. I will go to heaven and those will be my credit. They are mine. Nobody can take them. Paul says you have many, you have many instructors, but you have very few fathers. Yeah. yeah. So guys, this is your opportunity. And let me just say this, that this thing is so important because many people miss out. They, they miss out on the joy of the Christian life. Many people backslide because they find that they have no purpose in their faith. They got saved, they joined a life group, they did someone discussions every day, they sat in their life group, and at some point they just found themselves, they, they didn't even know, they just got bored. Am I talking to somebody in Mavuno Church uh, that you know about? Yeah, there are people who we know, they left the church, they just got bored and they backslid because they had no bigger purpose. Coming to church and hearing the word is not enough, guys. It will not keep you joyous in your faith long term. Bringing people to Christ never gets old. It will never, you'll be old and you'll still be excited about bringing people to Christ. I mean, it's so interesting. I mean, I get, I, I've brought a lot of people to Christ, but one of the fun things I always do is once in a while when it's my dad's birthday, I'll always put his picture there and say, I really honor this man. And I get such amazing comments. I mean, the last birthday I did that, I remember one lady who said, your dad brought me to Christ. I was a drug addict. He prayed for me. He believed in me. Now my husband and I are serving God and we love your dad. So good. So good. I mean, like, he's, he's an old man. He's 85 or something like that. But he's brought, this, this chick who wrote, I think, was 30. It's like, your dad brought me to Christ. <laughs> I'm like, this man is a saint. Like, heaven will rejoice when he comes. There are so many people he's brought to Christ. I want to be like him. Yeah, and I don't do it because I'm a pastor. Wherever I go, I'll bring people to Christ. This is who God has called us to be. You, you, you know, let me tell you, you start hearing things about church wounds. And oh, pastor so-and-so said this about pastor me, and, and, I, and, I, and I felt offended. Let me tell you, those offenses come because you're bored. They come because there's nothing you are doing. You're just sitting there waiting to be offended. When you're serving God, if somebody offends you, you say, look, I'm doing, a, I'm doing a big work, I can't come down. That's what Nehemiah said. He said it, I'm sure he, didn't, he meant something else. If he meant his own things, if he was trying to offend me, that's his problem. I've got a big job I'm doing. Yeah, you never hear people talk about church wounds when they're serving God, when they're busy bringing people to Christ. So, so a lot of the stuff we hear about, a lot of the messes we hear in church, is because people are sitting in the pews bored with no purpose. So, so having a vision that's bigger than us is what will keep us going as Christians. And the biggest vision is bringing people to him. When we become aware of the immense needs of the world around us, when we become aware of how powerful it is when one person comes to Christ, I mean, I can, I can imagine, Sumit has been a Mizizi um, this, uh, facilitator for years. This guy has impacted the faith of so many people. So many people. And guess what? All those, they're my downline. <laughs> If I hadn't brought him to Christ, none of those guys would be impacted. Isn't that awesome? Like, man, I'm so excited. This is my fruitfulness. I am fruitful because of the people that I've brought to Christ, because of the people I've discipled in the Lord. I mean, this is, it's such a, like, you don't have time for being bored. You don't have time to get, get it twisted and start worshipping money like so many of my friends ended up doing, people that we're in ministry with. Because you got bored. There's nothing bigger drawing you in. Let me tell you, take evangelism seriously and you will discover your kingdom purpose yeah all this thing of i'm looking for my purpose i'm waiting for god to tell me what are you waiting for just do god's work follow his last instruction and when you do you will find what you're supposed to be doing that's how you do it so anytime let me tell you anytime you go out preaching you will come back with joy anytime we go anytime we've gone with kina pastor james and his team to great war i come back with joy Every time I've gone to University of Nairobi just to share the gospel, I come back with joy. Every time my wife and I have shared our faith with people we've met, I, I'm always joyful. I can't explain it. If you want to have joy of the Lord, if you want to just be excited about Jesus and your faith, share the gospel. Just learn to share the gospel. Overcome that and just learn to, fear, uh, to share the gospel. Number seven, evangelism is saving lives. It's saving lives. It literally is saving lives. I mean, we read that verse, 1130 Proverbs. It talks about the fruit of the righteous, a tree of life. He who's wise saves lives. Um, it is saving lives. You know, the funny thing is, <laughs> I hear people sometimes say, look at how many churches there are in Africa. 
Look at how many churches there are in Nairobi. Like, do we really need other churches? Do you ever hear people say that? Yeah. Have you ever found it strange that nobody ever says, look at how many bars there are in Nairobi. Do we need more bars? Yeah. Like, people start bars next to bars and other bars next to those bars, and nobody complains. <laughs> it's a barcode. <laughs> 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 Pastor Kelonzi, I see you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, I mean, it's different when it's churches. People are like, there's too many churches. But, you know, it's interesting. The funny thing I hear is, like, there is a way that I look at it and I say, there's so many people dying. We can't have too many hospitals. We can't. And you know what? There are hospitals for all kinds of people. There's those Aga Khans that treat the guys who are up there. There's other hospitals in the cl clinics in the slums that treat people. But we need more hospitals. Nobody will ever say we have too many hospitals in Kenya. We need places where people would get saved. We do. And you know, it's interesting. When, when I started Mavuno Church, just before we started, we went to a conference with the guys we were starting with. And I remember one preacher from Australia said something really powerful. He said, never measure the size of your church by the size of your ambition. Measure the size of your church by the size of the harvest. Pastor James, when I look at this great wall over here, great wall wall with 5,000 apartments, just next. Like, we literally went with Pastor James to Great Wall 4. And it's brand new. Like, all the people there are new. And there was not a single Mavuno discipleship group. We have so many discipleship groups in Great Wall, but we didn't even, we can't keep up. There's so, there are so many lost people, just, God is just stacking them next to us. Just bringing them. Kaha West, whenever I go in to visit uh, Mavuno um, in, in Lifeway, man, you, have, you can't even find the church. The apartments around you are so many. It's like people are just dying around you. And my goodness, God put you there to save lives. Yeah, he put you there to save lives. Save families, save marriages, save opportunities. Sa take people to heaven. That's the biggest joy as a Christian. Uh, you know, it's interesting because Ezekiel 34 talks about people being scattered because of no shepherd. It talks about the fact that they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. Wow. This, is, this is what happens in Israel. There were no shepherds. Nobody cared about people being taught God's ways. So they became food for wild animals. That's what's happening in our cities today. Because the church is so busy with worship, worship. I didn't just make a mistake and repeat myself. We've become worshippers of worship. We become worshippers of experiences. Call for a worship night and the place is packed. Call for evangelism, three people show up. We're worshipping experiences, feelings. And because of that, guess what's happening? People are becoming food for wild animals. The demons are running amok because there's nobody bringing God's people back to him. And so, you know, it's interesting. Again, we read Matthew chapter 9, verse 37. It says, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Come on, guys, let's become the laborers. Let's choose to be the laborers. Jesus is, Jesus is actually mournful saying those words. He's like, the laborers are few. Ask God to raise. Somebody needs to say, Lord, I'm here. Pick me. Use me. Send me. If nobody else goes, I will go. Yeah. Let's become those people. Let's go. Number nine. Number eight. Am I eight or nine? Eight. eight. Evangelism is choosing obedience before persecution. Yeah. Um, it's, it's sending yourself before you're sent out by force. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> you know, the, the Jerusalem church, classic example, beautiful church, amazing apostles. Your pastors have been with Jesus personally. Have you ever been in a church like that? It's not like they had a vision. It's like they know him. They are his boys. When you say, uh, like, like, what did, you, like, what did Jesus, like Jesus say? Is, no, 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 actually, that's not how he said I was there. <laughs> what he told the leper was this. Imagine that's your pastor. You'd be like, man, that's a church we're all going to. Everybody's rocking there. The church is growing in numbers. But at some point, I think they forget that they're supposed to go to the ends of the earth. So guess what God sends when the church is doing too well? He sends persecution. And you read Acts, I think it's chapter 8. Is it chapter 8? Yeah, chapter 8, verse 4. It says, those who had been scattered preached the word everywhere they went. <laughs> In Jerusalem, it was the pastors preaching. Now when they were scattered, the whole church was preaching. Oh, man. They were doing what they should have been doing in the first place. Guys, don't wait for a persecution to come to Mavuno. Let's preach the gospel. Don't wait for Pastor Kilonzi to preach the gospel of Mavuno downtown. Preach the gospel. Yeah. So these guys went out and now they started preaching and the gospel spread and God's will was done. So evangelism is making sure, let me just, let me send myself before I'm sent. Let me, let me go before I'm kicked out. Let me say it that way. Let me go before I'm kicked out. It's like God is saying, if you don't spread out, I will spread you out myself. 
Do you ever have a mother who used to say that? If you don't pick up your things, I will show you how to pick them up. <laughs> Let me just pick them up. <laughs> I can see some of you shaking when I say that. You're like, trauma is still there. You do not want to hear your mother saying that. If, number nine. Number nine. Evangelism is taking advantage of the season. Taking advantage of the season. You know, in COVID-19, I felt like the world was coming to an end. And nobody knew. It's like, my goodness, what's God doing? What's God saying? I realized, you know, sometimes you read the book and it says, the trumpet will sound and the skies will part and the Son of Man will come. And you're like, dude, what is this? It sounds like a horror movie. And it's like, how does this even happen? It's so unrealistic. Then COVID comes and you can't go anywhere. And everybody's stuck in their house. There's no work. And you're like, you mean this thing can happen? It just sounded like stuff that would happen in the last days, isn't it? All of a sudden, reality becomes very close. It stops sounding like something made in Hollywood. It becomes life. And we start to remember, my goodness, I remember my wife and I, we were, and our kids, we were stuck at home. We were watching, we decided, let's start preparing. So we were watching all end time movies <laughs> and, 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 and doomsday movies. Like we used to, there's a series called Doomsday Preppers. So we're watching, like, what do people carry when they have to run out of home? Like, teens of Siju Wart. Like, this is how you make a, a line that can catch a fish. You're like, let's get some skills here, because we don't know whether the world is ending. And we're going to be living in caves before long. I mean, we're watching all this stuff with our kids, and our kids were like, yeah, bring it on, let's watch. What happens? How does Will Smith save the world at the end of all this? It's like, man, it's like the world could end like this. The Bible says that when God comes back, there'll be people just marrying as usual, doing the things they do as usual. And boom, he'll come like a thief in the night. People are like, how come the church didn't know? How come there are no prophecies? The prophecy was there 2,000 years ago. I will come like a thief in the night. What does that mean to you? It means that there will be no prophecy. He'll just show up. Yeah. Even the pastors will be caught playing golf. And it's like... So, so, so don't be that person who is caught by surprise. Understand the times. Read the signs of the times, guys. I mean, look at where technology is taking us. Look at what's happening now with government surveillance and all that. Surely, if there was ever a time that we should be thinking about the end of the time, it is today. It is today. Let's not be those guys blissfully unaware, doing our thing, not understanding that the Son of Man could be preparing the angels right now. And that some of the things we're seeing could even be some of the things in Revelation. I sent a calamity. <laughs> the angel blew his trumpet and a, and a plague was released. Maybe that plague was COVID-19. And here we are still saying, okay, when is COVID ending so that we can go back to life? <laughs> you don't understand that the scroll is about to be read and, and the sky is about to part. And the sun. We don't know. That's the whole point, isn't it? Jesus gives a parable about coming back, the master coming back and finding his servants, just abusing other servants, not even understanding the master is about to come back. We don't want to be those people. And so I think one of the things that the Bible talks about, the false prophets that are coming, the wars and the rumors of war, the pestilences, the earthquakes, persecution of Christians, all these things are happening today. What more do we need to do? And he says, in fact, he says, um, there's this verse he says, uh, when he was making that prediction in Matthew, just, just put the verse in Matthew 24. He says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Do you see this in the church today? The love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. That's what it says. And then just read the next one, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony for, to all nations, and then the end will come. And then verse 15, it says, at some point we'll get to verse 15. Okay, maybe we won't get to verse 15. All right. So, so, so it's okay. It's all right. Here's the thing, guys. Jesus is saying, these pestilences are here. But you know what he's saying? He's saying the thing that will preclude the end is the gospel being preached to the nations. That we have a part to play in ushering in the end of times. And he's saying, look, these things will come. People's love will have grown cold, but there are those who will wake up. There are those who will preach the gospel. And as they will preach the gospel to the nations, the end will come. It's a time when we first did uh, at Fearless, we, we went to Great Wall. To preach the gospel. You guys who are there remember. And I remember coming back and meeting a lady. I thought she was, I was actually going to share the gospel with her. Then she, I realized she was part of us. Even her, she was out sharing the gospel. And we had a chat and she came from Grateful. And she said something I'll never forget. She said, I've been part of Mavuno Hill City for a while. She said, I'm so glad our church is finally waking up. 
And she says, I've been praying. I've been praying that our church would open its eyes to the harvest because my neighbors are dying. And she said, I, 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 I've been praying that God would just awaken the hearts of my leaders. Man, people are dying around us. And these are the end days. And perhaps this is the time. Perhaps we're the ones who will wake up and usher in the end times. Perhaps we will be the end time army. Come on. Am I speaking to somebody here? I know you had a career. You wanted to be a master's degree architecture, but maybe, <laughs> what if Jesus comes before that? You know, sometimes those things make our plans seem a bit relative. Anybody who was sitting in the house, like for me, let me tell you, COVID-19, 2020, I usually have a heavy tra tra a traveling schedule. That year, it was so bad. We had planned with Penina, my assistant, that it was like a, it was like a well choreographed dance. You learn from Nigeria, I meet you in the airport, I dash your passport to the France embassy. And then you come in and rest. They have told us it comes out in a week and a half. A week and a half, you'll have it, you'll be ready to go. Uh, as you're going, the minute you land, South Africa is next. So we're going to get South Africa and Nigeria visa together. Like we had planned the year like that. Beginning of 2020. Is somebody, like it was going, the whole year, the, I'd planned so much travel, I was going to be there out more than I was going to be in. Boom. I come back from Nigeria. That was the last trip I took <laughs> out of East Africa until today. Like crazy. Like nobody had any anticipation that was going to happen. That's what's going to happen one day. I mean, one day you're going to realize all the things I'm striving for, boom, they're finished. It's over. That million shillings, I, that, that million dollars I was planning to make is no longer important where I'm going. That master's degree doesn't count where I'm going. And yet it was my big and one obsession. I'm not saying don't have plans, but I'm saying make sure they're not relative to the most important thing that is bringing people to Jesus. Um, John chapter 9 verse 4 says, as long as it is still day, we must do the work of him who sent us. <laughs> In fact, it says, night is coming when no one can work. That's a sober warning by Jesus. Jesus made some serious sober predictions. Night is coming when no one can work. There's a time that comes when evangelism becomes impossible in a nation. In, in, in communist Russia, you couldn't preach the gospel. You'd die. Night had come in that place. And yet before that, the church had been strong at one time. In China today, I mean, it's, it's not as easy to preach the gospel. I've tried, I mean, I've preached in China. <laughs> Let me tell you, the kind of things that they have to do, people have to run interference and blocks so that you can preach the gospel. It was a whole orchestrated thing. I remember it was so funny because I had to preach in one of the large churches. And... When we discovered, when the pastor asked me, told me, I'd love you to preach, but I have to get permits from nine government offices. What? Like the head of uh, police in the area, the head of the community, the Nyumbakumi, the area community where the church is located. I have to get one from the FBI equivalent in this country. I have to get one from the CIA equivalent who will have to check you out before you preach. I have to get one from like nine different authorities for me to preach. So being a very smart, spirit-filled man, uh, he said, we're going to do it this way. So he came, uh, he told me, send me your notes. So I sent him my sermon notes the day before. So, so he stood up and he said, today we're going to preach. I can't remember what, it was probably one of the parables, parable of the lost son. And he said, I want to teach about this. And he says, a great, it's one of Jesus' greatest messages. Uh, it's, it's a love. And he said a few things from his own thoughts about them. And he says, it's going to be, a, there are three points. But he said, you know what? It's so interesting because I was talking with a brother from East Africa. And I realized he has a powerful testimony on this verse. So I want him to come and share his testimony. So brother, come. So I came and I, sh so testimonies are okay. Sermons are not. So I came and I preached my sermon. And then at the end he came and summarized and said, now, in fact, I just think I don't even need to preach because he said everything I was planning to say. <laughs> Let's just have the altar call. I mean, night has come. You can't just preach the gospel. In Kenya, we preach the gospel anywhere. You can stand up in a matatu and preach and nobody will do anything to you. But night is coming, guys. Night is coming. Night has already started coming in parts of Africa. Yeah. One of our... I don't know which FBI's are watching this. But yeah, some of the places we're in, it's not as easy to preach the gospel. Even in Kenya, by the way, try and register a church. Yeah. The other day you could do it just at will. Try and register a church today and you'll see. It's, night is coming, people. A time will come when it will not be easy to preach the gospel. Yeah. I, when, I, when we were students in the States, um, I remember we used to do a lot of pretty bold things. And there's one time we had a speaker who came 
And he was from a ministry that helped people who are homosexual to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to reform. And he talked about it. There are testimonies from that ministry. It was a powerful ministry, powerful. They were doing great things. People, and people were being filled with the Spirit, and they would come and say, I was this. I was a transversetite. I was this. Now I'm full of the Spirit. I'm married. <laughs> I, have, I have children. It was powerful. You know, a few years later, this guy was attacked so badly by the state. They shut down his funding. They, they criminalized him. He had to apologize because of trying to, what is, I can't remember the word they use there. What is it? Conversion therapy, they call it. And it's criminalized because it's like, how dare you change what people have chosen to be? So he had to apologize and shut down the ministry. Night is coming, guys. Night is coming. This is the country of the free, of the free and the brave. <laughs> it's happening there. It's going to come here. So, guys, we have an opportunity, one life, one chance. We are fortunate. It's still day. Let's preach the gospel. Let's preach the gospel. Number 10, evangelism is how we change the world. Evangelism is how we change the world. At Mavuno, we know that the way to change the world is through turning ordinary people into famous influencers of society. We know that. We've talked about that all these years. Basically, this means we disciple people who are living for ordinary things, and we help them begin to understand life is more than that. Life is more than chasing money. That's ordinary. We help them begin to understand there's a fearless destiny God created you for. There's a purpose, a kingdom purpose. Help them begin to understand what that kingdom purpose is so they can change the world. That's what we've always talked about. Now, it's interesting because, yeah, change the world through the sectors of society. Impact, discover your sector of society. And nowadays, people are discovering these sectors more. You're going to hear language like mountains, uh, seven mountains, seven spheres. But really, our thinking about the sectors of society came from studying the mountains. And so it's really the same, one and the same. It's understanding how to engage Christians in the sector that God created them for. But you know, the, the thing you don't want to miss, however, is that to change the world, you have to start with the heart of the person. You can't do anything else. You have to start with people. You start a poor, an initiative to bless the poor in the slums, and you raise them up, and you don't preach the gospel to them, guess what you're doing? You're creating rich fools. We've seen this in some of our front lines. You're creating rich fools. You're creating people who are godless. In fact, they were even more godly when they were poor. But now you've given them the means to be godless. And you've done one thing, but you've created a worse thing. You've driven out one demon, seven more have come that are even more powerful than the ones that were there. Because you neglected the most important thing. There has to be a change of kingdoms. So, so understanding this, guys, is the thing that will help us change corruption in Africa. It's a thing that will help us because people, why is Africa so corrupt? It's because we've gotten a gospel that's half a gospel. When we, when we help people understand who they are in Christ, when we help people begin to understand what they are called to be, what, we will see a revolution of change. It's happened in other countries. It can happen here as well. We'll see a reformation. It can happen here as well. So this is what we are about, is helping turn ordinary people into fear, and it cannot happen without sh sharing the gospel. The gospel is at the heart of it. It's at the heart of it. You cannot start the journey without having Christ in your heart. So all our front lines, any ministry we're doing to children's homes to, to, to change, to impact the poor, beautiful, let's do it. We have to do it. But let's always remember the core message is that Jesus loves you. He has a plan for your life. He can change you and help you live a life of purpose. And if I don't leave you with that, I've left you with nothing. Money by itself will not help you. It will curse you. Yeah, we need to understand that. Um, first, it's very interesting because 1 Timothy chapter 13 to 40, uh, chapter 1, verse 13. Paul says something very interesting. And here is why I believe we can change even corruption. Uh, Paul says, Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Verse 14. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, I was a blasphemer. I was a violent man. I was horrible. But grace came and changed me. My goodness, there are corrupt officials right now waiting for grace to change them. There are corrupt guys taking government tenders, stealing COVID-19 money, and getting away with it and feeling very clever. They are just waiting for grace to come and change their lives. Somebody needs to preach the gospel and help disciple them. So that they begin to understand, my goodness, I cannot live like this. People can't be dying on my watch. The gospel is the only thing that can change the world. Laws don't change people. Laws only hide sin. When you have great laws, great laws are fantastic. I have nothing against laws. In fact, we need good laws. But a country governed by just laws alone without the heart, 
It just suppresses. The, Bible, the, the law just hides sin. It, it's a band-aid. I remember one time I was in, we lived in California with my wife. It's one of the cleanest places. Uh, well, yeah, maybe when we were there. It was really clean. <laughs> and I mean, you drive on the highway and it's clean. And I used to be like, man, these guys are so different from us. They keep their place clean. Until I started seeing the signs. $1,000 fine for littering. You throw a piece of paper out of your window. $1,000. How much cash is that in Kenya shillings? 100,000 shillings. $1,000. It's like, and those guys don't joke. And they have traffic cameras everywhere. Trust me, nobody would litter. One day I drove under a bridge. And it looked like I was driving in River Road in Nairobi somewhere. And I was horrified. I was like, man, that, this place is so clean. What happened here? It's like there's just things there. There's... Then I realized there are no traffic cameras here. The law hides sin. When, there's no, when, when the law is there, it works, yes, but the minute nobody's looking. See some of the riots that happened in LA when we were there. It's like the minute the law it breaks down, people get into their primal nature. That's who they really are. Because all the law does is suppress bad behavior. Grace changes bad behavior. Yeah. This is what we're about. This is why evangelism is so important for us. Paul is a murderer. He becomes a preacher of the gospel. One of my relatives was a, su a, su a successful businessman. I mean, he is such a rich guy, doing so well in his business. We used to pray for him and preach the gospel to him all the time. He would never get saved. And one day he explained, and I understood why. His business, successful firm, great things happening in that firm, the whole foundation of that business was corruption. Like, there's no tender he would get without sitting down with the procurement officer and giving something. There'd always be a, a pad, an envelope to pad the tender. There'd always be a way that he influenced the tender committee. And he that was his job. He entered into the places where the big guys would be because he knew once I have the conversation, the tender is just a formality. And so the guy was like, if I give my life to Jesus, it's over. I don't have a company. This is how I feed my family. Well, somehow he gave his life to Jesus and, you know, God, God, God just reached him. By God's grace, he got, he, got, he got saved. And true, he was right. His business went under. Because <laughs> he didn't know how to do business without stealing. But guess what happened? It was a rough three, four years as he now was taught by God about how to do kingdom business. And slowly, he started turning around. Slowly, he began to understand how to get divine ideas for your business. Slowly, he began to understand how to pray for business to do well. Slowly, he began to understand how to do business righteously and let that be a competitive advantage. Slowly, he began to understand how to hire righteous people to work for him. Slowly, he began to understand that this is my, this is my niche, that I'm the guy you can trust, that I will not steal money. So I may not get many businesses, but the people who want somebody honest will give me the business. Today, he's doing extremely well. He's doing extremely well but his business is built on righteousness. Amen. Yeah? Wow! That's the gospel. Who said that the gospel can't change a corrupt country? All you need to do is just repeat that. Repeat that across, and you will find your whole country changing. This is the power of the gospel. So when you bring a person to Christ, you change their corrupt nature. Who knows? You're changing, you could be changing the guy who's going to destroy this nation. He's going to be hired as a procurement officer by City Hall and cause the next golden bug scandal. And because you reach him before he does that, you save Kenya. Ha! Come on, somebody. Yeah, you just thought you were having a conversation with a high school kid. This one was going to be seriously corrupt. And now, they, now they've become a preacher of the gospel. That's what Paul was, isn't it? Being used by the devil, now he's spreading the gospel across the world. So, so this is what happens, and that's why you have to do evangelism. You have the potential to change a family, you have the potential to change a nation, you have the potential to change the world. Simply, I always think about the guy who brought Billy Graham to Christ. I think he was called Mordecai Ham. Nobody knows him, but everybody knows Billy Graham because this guy changed him. I'm sure he had no clue as he was preaching the gospel, someone in my hall is going to receive Christ and reach a million bring them to Christ. By the way, every time I preach and I do an altar call, that thought comes to my mind. I could be reaching the next Billy Graham. Yeah. Every time I'm sharing the gospel with someone on the street, that's my, the thought in my mind. I could be reaching the person who will change this nation. Number 11. Evangelism is enlisting God's power. It's enlisting God's power. That's a very powerful thing for me. If you want to walk in God's power, you want to walk in God's authority, then practice evangelism. Matthew 28, verse 20 says, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you, and surely I will be with you. We talked about that, the presence of God. Surely, boom. 
It's like surely, boom. It's like you don't have to do anything else. Just teach them to, boom. He doesn't say pray for, pray for 10 days in an upper room somewhere. And, mm -mm. He says just do this, boom. The power of the Lord will be with you. I will be with you. Not, he doesn't even say my power. He doesn't even say the angel will be with you. He says, behold, I, I, Jesus, will be with you. This is how you enlist God's power in your life. God will always come behind you when you're in his work. He will always come and back you up when you're doing his will. Psalm 91. Psalm 91, there's a great verse there, 14 to 16. It says, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. This is the Lord saying. He's speaking about you. And he's saying, I will rescue you because you're acknowledging me. You're not going to that office and keeping quiet, being a secret service Christian. So secret service that even... <laughs> Even heaven doesn't know you exist. You know, it's like black ops. You know those guys who even the government doesn't know they operate. You're doing your own thing. Verse 15. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Can you see all the big things that, that the government of heaven is saying it will do for you? Because you're representing it. He will call on me and he says, with long life I will satisfy him. Mm. And show him my salvation. Jesus is saying, just test me. God is saying, test me. Watch what I can do for you. Just do my will. Um, and then um, there's, there's one more. Psalm 91 here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, no, move to the next one. There's one other verse I gave you guys for this one. Um, yeah, Psalm 67. I need it was another psalm. God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. And then verse 2. That your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all the nations. This is something I learned to pray. By the way, when you pray for God's blessing so that you can do God's work, God will bless you. When you pray for God's blessing so you can swell your wallet, good luck. Yeah. Pray and fast for God to bless your business. And God is asking so that what can happen? So that you can go and run in Karura on Sundays. No. You stay poor. <laughs> At least you'll come to church and pray. Yeah. Lord, bless me because I, this business needs to go to other nations and bring the gospel there. Lord, bless me because I want to start that children's home through my business. God bless me because I want to give scholarships to poor children and to spread your gospel among them. My goodness, heaven is like, yes! You understand why I want to bless you? Because I want to see the eternal being spread on this earth. You see, I only see my role as, as a pastor. I'll only see my role as complete when I turn every member of this church into a minister. That's the, that's the day I'll know my work is done. When I see every single person here in Mavuno knowing, my goodness, the minister is not pastor, I am, we are the ministers. The pastors at the front, they're just there to help the ministry, to minister to the ministers, but we are the minister. Let me say, evangelism will take boldness. It will take boldness. Of course, there are fears. There are things that make us feel, like we talked about some of them, it's like the same thing, with, it's like, what if people think this about me? What if I share the gospel and I'm rejected? Surely, Jesus was rejected. What will, what will, it, what will it do to you when you're rejected? You'll die. You won't die. You just move on. In fact, the Bible says, well, you go to a town and you're not received, just wash your hands. See, at least it's not, your blood is no longer, don't tell them that, but in your, it's like your blood is no longer on my hands. I've done my work. Oh, maybe I've planted a seed. Maybe one day you'll come to hear somebody else will harvest. My job was just to plant the seed. So rejection shouldn't worry me. It's like, yeah, you've rejected. It's not me you've rejected. It's, it's God's message. God will save you. I don't have to fear. And you know, we talked, we talked about the fact that there's, when we did evangelism, and, and, and I really, really encourage this, like God, that day at Fearless, when I told you guys, let's go out and just pray for people, that was a divine idea on the spur of the moment. Like, we hadn't thought about that. It was like God said, don't go with a tract, don't go with a pre-packed message, just go and ask people, how can I pray for you? It's like the most powerful form of evangelism I know. I didn't even used to do it. Before that, I didn't used to do it. I had other ways of it. Like since that time, that's all the evangelism I've done. Is I meet somebody, I'm like, man, I, like, I love what you're selling. This is so awesome. Uh, I really, really like it. By the way, I'm from, like if I'm in Karen, I'll say I'm from a church called Mavuno Karen. <laughs> it's just next door. Pastor Grace is our pastor. And we're, we've been doing a little prayer experiment or prayer thing in this season. And I just want to know how I can pray for you. We're praying for businesses in this area. And the guy's like, Really? Yeah, so how can I pray for your business? And even for you, just tell me, oh, my wife, right now we're not talking. I mean, I'm shocked people actually answer. Like, I didn't know people need prayer. People actually need prayer. 
And, and it's like, yeah, no, no, my wife. And I'm like, okay, I'm really, really sorry to hear that. Is it something? Yeah, 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 just, okay. Can we just pray for you right now? And the guy's like, really, right here? Yeah, yeah. It's, don't worry, I won't embarrass you. It's just the two of us here. I'll pray really. Jesus, I just want to pray for my brother. Boom, 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 boom. Boom. Wow, thank you, man. Yeah. By the way, I have a question for you. Have you given your life to Jesus? No. Any particular reason? Well, just was never time. Well, maybe, would you, would you consider giving your life to Jesus right now? I'd love to pray for you. And you know what happens when you know Jesus for yourself? You pray for yourself. You don't even need me to come and pray for you. Really? By the way, <laughs> it's so funny. Whenever they say, yeah, pray for me, I'm always in shock. Like, even, even now, like 30 years later of doing this, I'm always like, for real, did you hear what I just asked you? Like, you want to give your life to Jesus? Like, okay, 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 it's going to be a real prayer, a quick prayer. Dear Jesus, come into my life. No, no, make me brand new. From today, I'm saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, my gosh, I'm so happy for you. This is so awesome. Hey, by the way, give me your number. I'll give you a call. In fact, I'm going to come back uh, on Friday. And in fact, on Sunday, are you, do you live around? I'd love for you to come to, okay, if you don't live around, oh, you live in Donholm, okay. I'm going to fi find a way to connect you with Pastor Milton because we've got a great service in. Okay, God bless. I'll see you Friday. Boom. And I go away and I'm like, oh, Jesus, yes. There's a party going on. My gosh. Right now in heaven, just because of me. Sometimes I've even forgotten what I came to shop for. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, this is it. I go to my car and I'm like, yes, Lord. This is it. By the way, I overcomplicate it. Sometimes you overcomplicate evangelism. That's what it is. It's just how can I... And by the way, like, be, be known for being the prayer supplier. In fact, maybe you should print, print cards called prayer supplier. They, there's water supplier. Why can't you be prayer supplier? You know, just print the card and, and just say, by the way, I'm a, I'm a prayer supplier. <laughs> yeah, try it. Like, by the, there's so many things you can... Like, in the office, whenever guys are stressed, by the way, me, I actually rejoice when I see stressed people. Because I'm like, that's an opportunity. Yeah. Like when somebody shares, my goodness, oh my, something broke, all this. I'm like, my goodness, I'm so sad. How can I, pr can I pray for you? Or oh, I have an exam. This is happening. I mean, we, I, I did this on Sunday when, when, when our friend told us he has a, an interview. And I just, come, let me just, I mean, he's a believer, but it's just become such a habit for me. I'm like, come aside. Let me just pray for you. And it's like, you know what? Somebody's like, oh my goodness, you took time to just pray for me. There's such gratitude. It just, it's a gift. It's like you're doing evangelism, but it's, it's like you're giving someone a gift. They love the fact that you prayed for them. And of course, there are those who tell you, no, 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 I don't want prayer. Those ones already know what you, they know your agenda. The devil has warned them already. The ones are a bit deeper in. The ones you just pray from a distance, prayer bomb. <laughs> Three points. Let God, let, let the prayer deal with them from a distance. But the ones who agree, pray. Let me say this. Um, I'm going to teach you three words. Um, and these are three Greek words as I conclude. Huh? There are words on prayer, because there are words on boldness, because prayer takes boldness. Evangelism, sorry, evangelism takes boldness. So the first word is, I don't know if you have the words on the screen. I did not. Oh, you actually have them. Well done, guys. Anagkazo. Somebody say that word. Anagkazo. Let's say it again. Anagkazo. So that's a word. Uh, and these are words that describe the kind of attitude that we need to have. Anakazo is an interesting word in the Greek huh? because it's, it's in Luke chapter 14, verse 23. Luke 14, 23. And it says, you remember the story where the guy threw a party and then nobody showed up and then he had to go and send out for guys who are in the streets. And then it says, then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them, compel them to come in that my house will be full. That word compel them, that's anakazo. Anakazo them. Compel them. This word actually means necessitate them, drive them, constrain them, by use all means necessary. Force if you have to. Do what you have to to bring them in. That's what the master was saying. Use threats, use persuasion, use entreaties. Bribe them if you have to, but bring them in. That's what he's saying. Compel them. Compel them. You know, this guy, he has spent a lot of money on a party. He's thrown his best gig. He's put in all his silverware. He's done everything he can. And then his buddies start to give him excuses. I've taken me a wife. Seriously? Like, you're not, now that you're married, you don't eat. You can't come for lunch. See, you're going to eat anyway. I've bought me a farm. The party's at night. Who goes to inspect a farm at night? It's like, these are just excuses. And the guy is so mad. 
Nobody's coming to his party. This is God. This is, God is, is the guy who's thrown the party. And, and Jesus is showing how God gets mad because he throws this party for Israel and his chosen people are not interested. And then he says, just go out into the streets and compel those ones out there. Bring them in. And basically, he's saying, use what force you can. People in the world are forceful about everything. People in the world are forceful about everything. They compel us to do things. But you know what? Christians are so shy. We're so shy. Let me tell you something. If you're really excited about something, you will sell it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know myself. When I'm excited about something, I sell it. I go to a nice gym. My goodness, you guys need to eat. You need to go to that gym. I, I, I start eating. My wife, Kwanza, is a good one at compelling. She starts taking herbs. She's a herbalist. Have you, have you ever tried Moringa? What? You don't even know what Moringa is? Oh my gosh. That's why your skin is how it is. And you're thinking, by the time we're finished talking to you, you're like, oh my God, I'm suffering. I need this Moringa. That's, that's compelling, isn't it? So why is it that the most important message in the world is the one we share with the least enthusiasm? We're not compelling about it. Anakazo. Somebody say anakazo. This is what God wants you to have. Uh, the next word is biazo. Biazo. Let's say it together. Biazo. Now, this one comes from Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. Biazo, Matthew 11, 12. It says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, to biazo. <laughs> and violent people have been raiding it. Mm. In, in New King James Version, I think I also put that one up. Do you, do you have that one? No. Let's, let's pause for that one. He says, he say, New King James says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. I love that. It's like, like the biazo. <laughs> we are one of the, we are the biazo. We are the violent. Basically what it's saying is use force, force your way in. The ones who are violent, it's like the, the, Sino, the Syrophoenician woman. And she's being told, you know, this, this is food for the children. You guys are still, it's not your turn yet. This is, it's like children. And she's like, dogs don't eat food for the children. Jesus is using harsh words to tell her it's not your time yet. She's like, let the, even the children, their crumbs fall on the ground. And the dogs eat it. Jesus, you're going to heal my daughter regardless. Ha! She has biazzled her way. She's where she's not supposed to be. That's a biazo. We're, we're forceful about everything else except the gospel. I mean, people are forceful when they sell alcohol. Have you seen the billboards? Just drive on Gong Road. You're going to see billboards telling you forcefully how this thing is going to make you feel good. How this thing is the best thing you could ever have. They're so forceful. But nobody's forceful about the gospel. We're not forceful about the most important thing. I mean, this is such a sad state of life. No wonder nobody believes the message because we don't seem to believe it ourselves. If we believe the world could end any time and you will be constrained to a hell, an eternity of hell without Jesus, surely you're my brother. How can I not force you in? How can I not push you? It's like I'm seeing a truck coming to hit you and you're insisting on staying in the middle of the road. I tackle you. If I believe you're really going to die, I will tackle you and use any means necessary to get you out of that road. So how is it that I, is it that I don't believe the message that you will die and go to hell? Somebody say Biazo. Yes. It's time for Biazo. As Christians, we have much more reason to use force. People are blinded by the devil. The Bible says the unbelievers, the eyes of unbelievers are blinded. And so we have to get in. That's why Romans chapter, the verse from Romans, just put the, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Somebody say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Paul's like, I'm not ashamed. Call me names, stone me, do what you will to me. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. This is the most powerful thing in the world. You will die without it. And so I will preach and you will stone me and throw me out of your city and I'll come back and preach again. That's the Apostle Paul. Third word, anaidea. Anaidea. Let's say that together. Anaidea. That's another word that is in the Bible that talks about the attitude we must have with evangelism. And in Luke chapter 11, verse 8, it says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of your friendship. You know that story? It's this guy who comes and knocks unashamedly at 12 in the midnight to ask for bread. And he says, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of your friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, 
your anaidea, shameless audacity. He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So imagine a guy coming to knock on your door, do, 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 and you're like, what's going on, what's going on? And it's like, it's your buddy. He says, marriage breaking, are, 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 people, are people dying in the house? No, he wants bread. <laughs> like, like, seriously, bread. <laughs> Just get it for him. It's like shameless audacity. The guy is like, I ran out of bread, there are no kiosks open. So you're the only guy I can wake up at midnight to give me, because I have guests. That's what you call shameless audacity. And I dare. And God is saying you must have. Jesus is saying you must have shameless audacity. The guy got it because of his shameless audacity. He pushed hard where nobody else would push. Many people would have told their guests, there's just no bread, it's past midnight, just go to sleep, in the morning we'll have breakfast. The guy is like, no way my guests are going to sleep hungry. No way my brother is going to die in hell while I'm here. No way my family is going to die on my watch. No way my office members are going to hell while I'm here working, earning a salary from this company. Not on my watch. And I dare. Shameless audacity. You know, this is such a crazy thing because many times we wait for people to come to us. We wait for people to get conviction. Shameless audacity means I go to you. It means I go to visit your house. It means a visitor comes to church and I say, can I come and visit you? When are you home? That's shameless audacity. Who asks that? And you go. <laughs> and you say, I'll come for lunch. <laughs> and you go. You know, we did that, didn't we? There's a, there's a lady, Pastor Dorcas, and I met she was, she was new in this church. She kind of knew me from a long time ago. Uh, she used to go to the church that I pastored, Nairobi Chapel. So she's like, oh, I'm here. And, my, I, and, and, I, and after I come into this church, so I'm like, okay, we talked a bit. I was like, we'll come for lunch. So she's like, really? Yeah, yeah, Pastor Kara and I will come for lunch. She's like, when, 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 when? By the way, like the next day she was like, when are you coming? She was so excited. I was surprised. So we're like, okay, we'll come on Wednesday. So we show up on Wednesday, and then I tell Pastor Carol, by the way, we can't go alone. We're not even the pastors of this area. We need to go with Pastor Jemo. So I call her, I tell her, I have, I have a plus two, uh, Pastor James and Dorcas. And she's like, it's okay, just come. So we show up at their house, and oh my goodness, Great Wall 4, she's made a spread. She's cooked her heart out. Her pastors are coming. I mean, she's new in the church. She's cooked this spread. And then her husband, who works in the bank, she's told him, you're taking a day off. So the guy is there to welcome us. And then she's called her parents. And her parents have come. So it's a whole family hosting us. And we sit there and we have this conversation. It's a beautiful afternoon. They're such a great and hospitable family. And we sit there for about two hours. And I call the husband aside. I just want to get to know him. I've never met him. And I find out he works. He worked at Nairobi Chapel for a small stint. Um, so I, as you get to know the person, you get to know who they are. And so when we sit down at the table, the Holy Spirit moves, moves me to say, by the way, we are starting small groups. We're starting discipleship groups in the estates. And this estate is so new, we don't have a group here. By the way, they're so, so happy we've come. In fact, that's what he, all he was telling me when we were together. It's like, I can't believe the four of you would come to our house. So when I say we're hoping we can start discipleship groups in the estate uh, that can disciple people here, he's, I just see his hand going up like, we can do it here. Like we left that house having signed up a discipleship group leader, not a member. Like guys were like, we're here to serve. Are you with me? Shameless, we need to have shameless audacity. We need to have shameless audacity. We don't wait for people. By the way, I used to be a person who was very polite. I'm no longer polite. Nowadays, I have shameless audacity for the gospel. Shameless audacity. I talk to businessmen in this church. Some of them will tell you. I call them and I say, Muslims are building mosques when they build estates. How can you be building for yourself? Who is getting saved where you're, where you're building? Why is that business of yours not representing the gospel? What are you doing when God holds you accountable? What is, by the way, I've had some rough conversations. But to my surprise, many of them are like, Dan, nobody ever asked me this. I'll do it. What do you want me to do? You want me to give money for church planting? Fine, let's do it. One of my really good friends, I had this conversation, I've been friends with him for the last couple of years, I've never asked him this. And he has huge buildings. He builds big estates. And he told me he was very offended. Later he told me, I was very offended when we had that conversation, Pastor. But as I prayed about it, I realized what you said is true. And he said, I'm committing myself. Every building we put up from now on, we'll have a church inside and we're partnering with Mabuno Church to actually put a church in that place. 
And then, and Sunday he showed up at Pastor Maisha's church. And he said, we have a building next to you. You can use our common room for campus trend from today on. And then he told him, you've been having, you've been storing your equipment all the way in, where were you storing it? Lifeway. In Lifeway. It's too far from Kiambu. Come and I'll give you a room in my building. You can store all the church equipment in. And we'll use my truck to take the equipment there. You don't have to pay for a truck. Shameless audacity, somebody. Yeah, there are things out there. The Bible says you don't get because you don't ask. Yeah, there are people who are waiting to be saved and you've not asked them. You've not prayed and said, God, give me shameless audacity to ask them. And they're just waiting for you. So God, may God fill us with the Holy Spirit. May God give us a spirit of boldness. May God give us a spirit of shameless audacity. May God give us a, a spirit of boldness and courageousness. May we, may, we, may we have the strength to share, even when we're afraid, because fearless, fearless doesn't mean that you don't feel fear. It means you do it despite the feeling of fear. That's what fearless is. You go despite the fact, because you know who's with you. That's what we are. May the Spirit enable us to share the gospel without fear. God's people, the world is dying. Revival comes. And the revival is when the Holy Spirit shows up among people. But I pray that this revival will not be a revival of people just enjoying the warmth of fellowship. The East African revival, the longest revival ever in the history of the world. I don't know if you guys know that. Continuous revival, 50 years. And it began in Rwanda and Uganda, came to Kenya, went to Tanzania, eventually spread out across the world. But what made that revival so powerful was shameless audacity. My parents were part of that revival. And one of the things you'd always find, so how many people are parents who are in the East Africa, to Kutene Reza? Anybody? Yeah, we're here, we're there, we're many. We're products. These guys were so shameless, they'd meet you and say, hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm saved. <laughs> like, how is that for an opener? It's like you, you just have to, uh, me, I'm so-and-so, yeah. <laughs> oh, so you're not saved, Sour. Let's talk about that. It's like, they were just shameless. And because of that, they brought about a revival. Crazy revival, fires of revival across all denominations. But the thing that characterized they were unashamed about evangelism. They shared the gospel wherever they went. And God's power was shown. And so whom shall you fear? Psalm 27 verse 1, my, one of my favorite verses. The Lord is the light of my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Let's put aside fear and follow Jesus. I want to conclude. I want to conclude. In fact, let me, let me just share these verses about boldness. I want to give you a few verse, verses because I suspect fear is the thing that will keep us from achieving this word. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. It says, Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. This is God's word to somebody in the house right now. Be on your guard, be strong in your faith, be courageous, be strong. <laughs> Proverbs 28, verse 1. Proverbs 28, 1. The wicked flee though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Oh, come on, anybody righteous in the house. Boldness like a lion. This is what God is saying. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 to 8. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, mm. but he gave us a spirit of power, love, self-discipline. This is a spirit right now that is in the house. The spirit that enables us, that removes fear from us, that causes us to understand that that person that I'm afraid of or was intimidated by, it's because I didn't understand where they were going. They were on a one-way ticket to hell. I'm the only person standing between them and an eternity without their God. It's me. That removes fear from me because I'm like, you need me more than I need you. God has sent me here to save you and keep you into the destiny he called you to. Acts chapter 4 verse 31. Acts 4 31. He says, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Boldness is the mark of the Holy Spirit in your life. You will share the gospel boldly. You are going to lead people to Christ this year. No, tell your neighbor, he's talking about you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You will lead people to Christ this year. Because the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And you, you, will, be, you, he, you will be witnesses to him in your Judea, in your Samaria, to the ends of the earth. The Lord is going to prepare platforms for you to share the gospel. Some of you are going to be asked by your extended family at the party to speak up and to share a small speech. That is the platform he's preparing for you. Some of you at the end of year party or in one of the company uh, events, you'll be asked to represent your department and make a speech. Oh my goodness, the Lord is going to prepare places for you. And some of you, the Lord will prepare the table for you in the presence of your enemies. 
you're going to still speak with, without fear. And listen, the Lord told the disciples, don't fear about what you say, just stand up and say it. Because the Spirit will give you boldness. So long as you're aligned with me, I'll give you the boldness and I'll give you the words to say those things. That you will not fear. This is my prayer. I speak over you that there'll be no, nobody in your family who will not know Jesus. Yeah, that husband of yours, yes, he's becoming saved this year. This is a year of salvation. That troubled child of yours, this is a year of salvation. I speak over you that many of you will have the joy of bringing your children to Christ. Ah, there's nothing better. You will be a biological parent and a spiritual parent. That's, that's our destiny. My wife and I, we, jo we rejoice. We are double parents to our children. We brought them to Christ. There's nothing better. We're seven years old, four years old. Will you receive Jesus? Yes. Kneel down. Let's pray. Dear Jesus. Oh, so good. That's going to be your destiny in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Some of you, you're going to bring children around. The children around your children are going to come to Christ. Yeah. The boldness is coming, not just to you, but to your children. We've had the joy this year of seeing one of our children bring nine of our friends into campus trend. She just met them, day one of campus. And she just told them, I have a friend I need to introduce you to. And the friend was Pastor Kilo over here. And now they're part of campus trend. They're meeting every week. She's in her third week of campus, by the way. Oh my gosh, Jesus, you're doing it through my children. Yes. Oh, come on, somebody just stand up right now and begin to say, Lord, I receive this blessing. We call it out. We receive it. Lord, I take it for myself. I will be bold for you. Lord, when you, as you fill me with your spirit, I receive your spirit. Give me now the words. Give me the boldness. Give me the opportunity. Give me the platform. Hey, if you have people who are unsaved, begin to speak their name right now in the heavenlies. Begin to say, this is the year. This is the year of so and so salvation. I will knock on the gates of heaven. I will remove by force the blinders the enemy has put in their eyes. Salvation is coming to my family this year. I will bring them to Christ. I will be bold to visit. I will go to people's homes. I will be shameless. I will be forceful. I will do what it takes. Hey, come on, somebody just begin to dedicate your... Lord, use me. Here I am, use me, Lord. Lord, I want you to make me your plan A. I want you to work through me. I want the Spirit to flow through me. I want to have the joy of salvation. Not just my salvation, but the salvation of people around me. I want you to use me as an agent. Lord, I want people to be changed because of me. Come on, call the name of the Lord. Lord, I need you. We thank you, Lord. You are going to do this thing. You're going to do this thing, Lord. And Father, I thank you because you're going to make a way where there seems to be no way. Lord, our family, some of them have been trapped in witchcraft. Have been trapped in all manner of things. Just, just strongholds and bondages that have been passed down through my ancestors. It ends with me. It ends with me because people are coming to Jesus in my family. Lord, wherever you planted me, wherever you put me, I'm on mission. That job you've given me is to bring people to you. I will have your agenda, kingdom agenda. This business of mine, I dedicate it. Come on, dedicate a business right now. It will bring people to you, Lord. You will show me how. But Lord, this business is a kingdom business. It's about the Father's business. And so Lord, I just want to bless you. I want to thank you because you're here, Lord. I thank you because you're sending us. I thank you that none of us is not sent. Every one of us is sent. Every one of us is called. And Lord, we receive our calling. We receive our commissioning. We will go. We will go, Lord. Lord Jesus, give us an infectious love for you that will shine and people will even want to know what we have. But Lord, also give us a shameless boldness that will go out and compel people to come to you. And so, Father, we honor you, we bless you, we thank you. You're such an amazing God. We love you, Lord. And we pray all these things in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And God's people come and say together, Amen. 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 Let me invite Pastor Kelonzi to take over.